So first of all, let me thank the organizers uh, for putting this together and uh, for allow allowing me to participate, even if it's only remotely. So obviously I wish I could be in Paris um, to celebrate this event. So today I want to tell you about a story related to measurement-induced criticality. Um, so I'll, you know, I'll define what this is shortly, uh, but you'll see hopefully that this overlaps with many of Hubert's interests and so this will have to do with entanglement and somewhat surprisingly uh, despite my best efforts to avoid log cfts uh, they, sh they show up in this context all right so before i start let me just say happy birthday hubert i'm sorry i cannot be in paris right now uh, so this is a picture that was taken um, at my phd defense and that was already more than eight years ago. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was really wonderful work, working with Hubert uh, during my thesis. And even now I feel like my topics are always inspired by uh, my, you know, my taste in problems is inspired by my discussions with Hubert. Uh, so thank you. So uh, before I start, let me just briefly acknowledge my collaborators. So the story I'm going to tell you about was done in collaboration with many people. I'm not going to go through the list. Uh, let me just emphasize like the, my main collaborators on the story I'm going to tell you about today. Uh, so it's something I started working on a while back with Andre Andreas Ludwig, Andrew Potter, Yi Zhuang Yu, and Xiaoming Jian. And I'm going to mention some recent stories with all of these people, in particular my student, Udgarsh, I got well. Okay, so let me get started uh, and tell you briefly what this talk is going to be about. So I'm going to be talking about entanglement again, uh, and I guess Robert gave a nice introduction to entanglement, so I don't have to. Um, so I'm going to be talking about situations where um, you can have a phase transition in how the entanglement behaves. Okay, so this is something that's now called entanglement transitions uh, in the field. Okay, and so the basic question is whether you can, you know, slow down entanglement growth uh, during time evolution of a many-body quantum system. Okay, um, and whether by tuning some parameter, I'm going to call it G here, you can tune a transition in how entanglement is growing in dynamics, or maybe how it's scaling in eigenstates. I'm not going to talk about eigenstates today. Um, so you have this kind of cartoon here below where, you know, maybe the generic situation we are all used to is entanglement entropy would be growing linearly with time, you know, in a typical, say, non-integrable system, uh, or integrable for that matter, but I'm, I'm going to talk about non-integrable setups here, uh, and saturates to uh, volume low entanglement, so I'm working in 1D, so it would be proportional to the size of the interval, but maybe as you crank up some parameter, you can really tame this entanglement growth and maybe only reach, say, our yellow entanglement, okay? Um, and so, you know, this may seem like a weird type of transition, uh, but we now have quite a few examples, and I'm just going to talk about a specific example here today. Um, so more precisely, I'm going to talk about um, so-called measurement-induced transitions, uh, which were introduced in those beautiful papers by Skinner, Ruman, and Nahum, and Lee Chen Fisher a couple of years ago. So let me spend some time defining precisely what the model is. Okay, so the basic idea uh, to drive such an entanglement transition will be to use the competition between scrambling or chaotic dynamics, if you want, that will tend to grow entanglement, so just unitary quantum dynamics of a many body quantum system and measurements. Uh, which are projective and will disentangle the system. Okay. Um, so more precisely, we're going to, you know, this is quite of a generic transition and then there's some universality to it. Um, but I'm going to present it in the way it was done in those original papers, because it's also the setup in which it will be easier to analyze theoretically. So we're going to consider a model with discrete time, uh, which will be, so you have space and time, and I'm going to think of a quantum circuit. Uh, and in particular, we're going to consider a random unitary circuit, okay, following the uh, works of Adam, uh, Nahum, and collaborators. 
Uh, we're going to use this as a nice toy model for chaotic dynamics in which we can compute many things analytically. Okay, so you have this brick wall pattern. Each rectangle here is a unitary gate, which acts on a pair of qubits. Okay. Um, or Q dits, if you want. Um, so, and each gate is random in space and in time. Okay. So you can think of this as some kind of improvement if you want it on random matrix theory, or you put more structures. So you have unitarity of quantum mechanics, and you also have locality, right? You, you have local interactions between your, your qubits. Okay. Uh, and you can do many, many beautiful things on those circuits. You can compute, say, entanglement analytically. Okay, and entanglement is growing basically as fast as it can uh, in, in those circuits. Okay, all right. And so the second ingredient is going to be local projective measurements. So every time you see a blue uh, dot, a blue circle here, uh, with some probability p, we're going to measure the state of this qubit. Okay. So, uh, and so when I say measure, I mean measure in the quantum mechanics sense. Uh, so this is, you make a projective measurement. So if you find that your spin is up, you project onto up, okay? And you normalize your wave function afterwards. And the outcome of the measurement obviously depends on the wave function following the usual laws of quantum mechanics, okay? And so, but you do this only with some probability P. So if you want, you have some kind of rare, um, some rates of those measurements, uh, and in some way, you can think of those measurements as errors that could come from coupling to some environment. Okay. And so you can see that if P is one, okay, so if P is zero, you have no measurements, you just have unitary dynamics, which is random on top of it. So there's no conserved quantity here, uh, not even energy, right? And, you know, you, you just have quantum, again, very chaotic evolution. Um, but if P is one, at each time step, basically, you measure every single spin in your system, okay? So you measure the first spin, you find it's up, you measure the second spin, you find it's also up, the next spin down, and so on. But once you do this, you just project it onto that product state, so entanglement is zero, right? So this is, if you want some kind of Zeno, many-body Zeno effect, you just measure the system and you project onto that state. So you can see you kill entanglement in this way. And so what those, uh, people realize in those papers, uh, mostly numerically, and, and they, they study numerically that, that there's a transition between those two regimes. Okay, so you can study this transition as a function of time, uh, or you can also run this for a very long time and think about a steady state. Um, okay, so this is the entanglement entropy of like uh, half of the system versus the size of the subsystem, sorry, that's a subsystem A versus size of the subsystem. When P is zero, you can see that you have volume loss scaling. Uh, this is a log log scale, so it's maybe not super easy to see. Uh, but when you crank up P, you see that eventually entanglement just saturates. And the black curve here is where the transition is. Okay, so those are fairly big systems. I should say that's using Clifford gates. It's a technical detail. Um, if you actually do that setup here, you cannot do a lot more than 20 spins. Okay. So there's been a lot of activity on this transition, uh, and it's related to quantum error corrections. And uh, you know, you can think that the unitary dynamics is kind of hiding quantum information from the measurement. So there are many beautiful interpretations of that transition I'm not going to talk about. Um, here mostly I'm going to talk about uh, its relation to CFTs and, and how we can understand this analytically. So here are some numerical results, uh, which are from uh, this paper by Matthew Fisher and collaborators. So what I've shown here, they computed like the Rényi entropies, um, and they found that numerically those Rényi entropies they behave. You know, they, you can do some finite scaling analysis, finite size scaling analysis, and there appears to be some kind of second order phase transition. You can do standard collapses. And you find critical exponents, and there's some degree of universality here. Um, <clears throat> so, for example, it doesn't depend on the size of the on-site Hilbert space, uh, when at least when it's small. Uh, and you find that you know you have a correlation and exponent that's near 1.3, maybe a near pair correlation value. Uh, maybe more interesting, uh, even more interesting, you have a dynamical exponent that happens to be one. 
And even more than this, uh, numerically, you find that there appears to be conformal invariance uh, in this problem. Okay, and so the way you can check this is by computing the mutual information of two regions. So you use periodic boundary conditions, you have two intervals. In principle, the mutual information could depend on all the position x1, x2, x3, x4, but numerically they find that it only depends on the cross ratio. Okay, so combined with z equals one, um, you know, this tells you this, it is, that there's conformal invariance in this problem. Okay, so I should say it's very surprising that here, you know, this is a quantum mechanical problem. You have time and space. It's an open system in some way, right? Because you're making those measurements. It's especially surprising that there's some kind of isotropy between space and time here. All right, so in the rest of this talk, I want to tell you about uh, some of our work to try to understand this uh, model uh, analytically, at least in some regimes, okay, and try to come up with a formalism to, uh, to understand this. So how can we think about this? Um, you could be pessimistic that this could be done analytically, right? Because, well, it's quantum dynamics, it's on equi non-equilibrium, you have to compute entanglements, and on top of it, those measurements are you know, very nonlinear. You have to renormalize the wave function at, at the end of the day, and every time you make a projected measurement. Okay, and so we want to compute entanglement, average over those random gates. Uh, so called them, you know, from the half measure, uh, we want to sum over the measurement locations and also average over the measurement outcomes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so let's try to do this step by step. Uh, so for each circuit, um, you can, so, so let's think of a circuit and let's say every time I have a red dot is where I actually had a measurement. Okay, so maybe this pin was up, this pin was down and so on. And let me not normalize the wave function. So every time you just put a projector, right? If you measure the first pin, you up, you put a projector onto up here. So you lose some weight every time you make a measurement. And now you, let's call this a quantum trajectory, right? Uh, a particular path of your wave function where you found some outcome of the measurement. And you ask uh, with which probability does this occur? Well, it, it, you know, the laws of quantum mechanics or bond rule, if you want, tells you this occurs precisely with the square of the norm of the wave function. So just trace of rule, okay? Uh, and of course, if you sum of all the measurement outcomes as that I call M, uh, sum of M of PM is one. Okay, so those are just probabilities. So what we want to compute in equations is uh, this equation in the lower corner here. So we want to compute Rényi entropies. Rho is not normalized. So this is why I have this trace of Rho in the denominator here. You have to normalize your wave function to compute the Rényi entropy. And we're summing of a measurement outcomes and we're weighting things by trace of Rho. So that's, this is the bond rule. This is just to, you know, the laws of quantum mechanics that tell you that the outcome of the measurements will depend on the wave function itself. And we want to average this over all possible circuits. Okay. So it still looks like a hard problem, but at least we turned this into an equation. Um, so now the next step is, um, well, there's, you know, we have a lot to average. And um, uh, of course, as good physicists, when we want to average a log, we, you know, one natural reflex is to think of the replica trick. And so that's what we're going to do here. We're going to use just this formula and I can use the fact that the average of the log is hard to compute, but the average of uh, powers of a density matrix is a lot easier to compute. Okay, at least when n and k are integer. And of course, at the end of the day, we'll want to analytically continue to k goes to zero. So k here is a replica index. Okay. <clears throat> so the claim is once you do this, actually this average can be performed exactly is when n and k are integer, okay? And it maps the calculation of this entanglement entropy onto a 2D classical statmec model, okay? Where you're starting to see maybe why we'll have a CFT. Okay. Um, so I'm not gonna go into all the technical details. I'm just gonna quote one of the key formulas that we use, um, which, you know, is, is pretty common in those random circuits. So we, we're doing, we have, replicas of the system, so call it Q. Q is the number of replicas is n times k plus one. 
So n is the Rennie index, k is the replica number, and the plus one is because of this bond rule factor. So we want to average, like, when you, know, you have all those replicas of your system, of your circuit, and say we want to average over those unitary keys. And we're looking at a density metric. So we have U and we have U dagger. Okay, and we want to average over a unitary, uh, you know, a gate from the unitary. So thankfully, this is something we know how to do. It's known as one garden calculus. Um, I, you know, the details of this won't be too important. The important thing is like this average leads to uh, a sum of the permutations of the replicas. And I, I'm, I'm sure in this audience, it won't be too surprising why you have permutations emerging here. Uh, okay, so this is a consequence of Schoenweil duality. Um, in general, like those degrees of freedom, which are going to be the spins in our static model, they belong to the commutants of the group that you consider. Okay, so here I'm doing the I'm doing R gates, just the unitary group. So this is the traditional Schoenweil duality, and you just get permutation of your replicas. Uh, but you can generalize this to other groups. So in particular, we're working now on the Clifford group, which is uh, particularly nice for numerical simulations, and so that's progress with Gad Ongli, Matthew Fisher, and, and Andreas Ludwig. Okay. So, but by doing this, you see that we can do this average, and we have those one, one garden functions, uh, which, again, won't matter too much, like the details won't matter, and we have this, the sum of the permutations. So, the basic, <clears throat> uh, you know, the, the key result that we have is that you can express exactly this average of, like, moments of trace of row or some type of trace that I haven't specified yes, yet uh, with Q number of replicas, some of the measurements, measurement outcome and average over circuits, we can rewrite this exactly as a 2D statmic model defined on the circuit. Um, every time you have a unitary gate, you have two permutations and there's some Boltzmann weight that I'm not, you know, whose precise form doesn't really matter. Um, and that after this, we can compute entanglements by doing various traces uh, or partial traces. And this ends up mapping to different boundary conditions on that statmic model. You're computing entanglement at time t, and so this is like imposing some boundary condition uh, in some entanglement interval a. So at the end of the day, it looks something like that. Uh, your entanglement entropy is given by some replica limit of the free energy cost of changing the boundary condition. Uh, in the region A, okay, uh, and so I, I, you know, if you want the technical details, you can have a look at the papers. But what will matter here for this talk is just the qualitative picture you get out of this, and the qualitative picture is something very nice, or at least that really naturally tells you why you have a transition uh, in this model. Um, so this is something we proposed in those papers, and I'm uh, here stealing a picture from this other paper by Ehud Altman and collaborators. Um, so let's imagine the statmic model is just an Ising model for simplicity. In general, it's a ferromagnetic magnet and you have a replica limit, but let's imagine it's just Ising. Um, it turns out that P, like the probability, the rate of the measurements just drives a transition. It, it's related to temperature. So when P is small, the statmic model is in a ferromagnetic phase. Um, and uh, we're asking about how much free energy does it cost to change the boundary conditions. So let's say you had uniform up at the boundary and now you create a region where you force your spins to be down and you ask about the free energy cost of this. And of course, it's a ferromagnet, there's a line tension. This is gonna scale with the size of your interval. Okay, and so this corresponds to volume law entanglement. That quantity is actually like entanglement entropy here. Okay, but now if you crank up, you have you just go to a paramagnetic phase, where now you have a domain wall condensate in the bulk and creating forcing inserting a domain wall at the boundary doesn't scale with the size of the interval. So that free energy cost is constant, and that corresponds to an area low phase. Okay, so you can see like you mapped something that was very complicated up here, a priori, right? This was just entanglement in this bottom circuit to something fairly simple, which is just a domain wall uh, in a classical statmic model. 
Okay. Of course, the complexity here, I'm cheating by saying this is an Ising model. Uh, the the StatMec model is very much not an Ising model, and we want to take a replica limit, but at least qualitatively, the physics is kind of clear. Okay. So the main conclusion is entanglement is the pre initiated cost of a domain wall. So this maps this entanglement transition onto a simple ordering transition into E. Um, it also naturally explains like scaling at criticality. So of course at criticality, this uh, we, we know how to play with boundary conditions. Uh, and you know, this that make model will be described by a CFT, and this domain wall free energy cost will just be related to the two-point function of a boundary condition changing operator. And that tells you that the entanglement will scale logarithmically at criticality. Okay. So emphasize this is not the entanglement of the ground state of the CFT, right? So here it's a boundary function in that CFT. Okay. And alpha n will be related to the scaling dimension of this BCC operator. Um, and if you do the same mapping for visual information, you see that it maps onto a four-point function and explains this conformal invariance that was that is observed numerically. Okay. Uh, so even without actually writing down what the static model is, qualitatively, there's still a lot of physics that you learned here. Okay. So up to now, I didn't actually write down the static model uh, because it's kind of complicated and nasty. There is one limit in which it becomes extremely simple. Um, if you take the on-site Hilbert space, we we'll call it D to infinity. So instead of acting on qubits, you act on qubits, like a D-level system where D goes to infinity. Um, and, and so in that case, the Cartesian function is just what I wrote here. Uh, and again, in this audience, I probably don't even need to say this is a POTS model. Um, the number of states, the states in that POTS model are those permutations. So you have Q factorial states in, in that POTS model. And of course, there we can take the replica limit exactly, and uh, you find that the transition is just given by percolation. Okay. Uh, so this is maybe a bit natural, right? That this transition where you make those measurements is related to percolation. And of course, in that case, we know the critical exponents and we can make compute many other things exactly. So <clears throat> there's this regime where you just have classical percolation. Uh, however, like for finite on-site Hilbert space, like you know, typically people do qubits, so the on-site Hilbert space is two. Uh, the transition is not percolation, it's more complicated. And um, the way we understand this is like this infinite Hilbert space limit has a very large symmetry. It has a POTS symmetry, SQ factorial. Uh, and the actual symmetry of the static model is just a permutation symmetry, SQ. There's a left-right multiplication by, by the permutation group. Uh, and this is a subgroup of SQ factorial by Kelly's theorem, right? So you can, um, so, so the way we understand this is like um, the, the actual transition is a CFT. It has central charge zero because it follows from a replica trick and the partition function is tri trivial. Uh, so in particular, it will have to be a log CFT. Um, and we understand it as the infrared fixed point of percolation plus some relevant perturbation. Um, and Today, we really don't have a lot. Uh, you know, this is a very hard problem. We don't know, uh, we don't have analytical results about this fixed point. Uh, here's the very formal field theory, which is not too practical for calculations. Uh, again, it looks like a parts model plus some type of perturbation, uh, which is a, if you want, like a, some type of two hull operator, uh, which is relevant and will drive the transition to some other fixed point. So analytically, we don't know much, but we've made a lot of progress recently to understand that transition numerically, at least. So we can do many things that are familiar to many people in the audience uh, in, in the context of these ordered classical static models that are described by a, a CFT. Uh, so in particular, we can play games with transfer matrices and extract Lyapunov exponents and effective central charges. Um, so, but, you know, the way it works is not trivial here, uh, but basically you can think of the time evolution as some sort of transfer matrix. Um, you know, the static model has trivial partition function in the replica limits, uh, but you can define some type of average free energy, just like you could in a disordered static model. And, and this static free energy ends up having a very nice physical meaning. It's the entropy of measurement of a so what does that mean? You, you run your circuits, you find measurement outcomes, 
So the first spin is up, those two spins are down and so on. And again, this configuration is gonna occur with some probability, right? I call it PM. And you can form, you can compute some entropy of those probabilities, and that's what we call entropy of measurement holder. And the fascinating thing here is that this entropy behaves like a free energy. And so in particular, you know, thanks to conformal invariance, it scales with the familiar one of L squared contribution at criticality. So this allows you to e extract uh, the C effective, cent the effective central charge of that CFT. Right, so effective central charge in the way of disordered static models. So this is the derivative of the actual central charge with respect to the replica number in the replica limit. So this is something you can measure numerically, something we can also compute in that percolation limit. Okay, and, and of course the, the value that you find in numerics is different from the one that you get at very large D. Okay, and so we can even go beyond this. We can, uh, so this is like the free energy. We can also define excitations. We can extract Lyapunov exponents if you want. And you can really extract, again, scaling dimensions from the scaling of those free energies. And so we, you know, this is hard numerics, but you can extract some information about the spectrum of that CFT, at least numerically, uh, uh, from numerics. Okay. <clears throat> Since this is a disordered, it, morally it's a disordered problem, it also exhibits uh, multifractality or multi-scaling. Uh, okay, so um, if you look at correlation functions, you, you can either from the transfer matrix or you can define correlation functions in that model by inserting ancillas. Uh, I, I, Michael Collins and David Hughes have been doing this. I should have a reference here. Uh, you can consider, you know, average of moments of, of those observables and on the cylinder, like, or in general, they will scale with the scaling dimensions will have a non-trivial behavior on N, okay? And so again, we can play like similar games where say Jesper and John uh, did a while back. Uh, we can do a cumulant expansion to, to extract this numerically and, and we can check this multifractality in this problem. Uh, here I'm showing, uh, I'm showing some probability, rescale probability distribution. So this is minus log of a correlator and this is the probability distribution of, of this correlator um, rescaled uh, in, in the way that was introduced in that paper by Andreas. Okay. Uh, so the fact that you get a collapse tells you uh, that you have multifractality and that function is related to X1, uh, some kind of Legendre transform. Okay. Uh, all right, so, so we, we are understanding a lot about that transition and there's, uh, you know, there's even, there are many variants we, we can do, uh, let me just briefly mention, like we, we've been playing with adding symmetries to that model, like for example, adding a U1 symmetry. Uh, here again, you can derive some kind of statistical mechanics model and the way charge is behaving in that model is related to a six vertex model um, or some kind of symmetry exclusion process, but with, that's constrained by measurements. And we seem to find like, uh, you know, we claim there's a, there's a new transition related to charge dynamics. So really the, those measurements can lead to a lot of new physics. So in addition to the entanglement transition here, there's a transition in how much the measurements can extract, how much information the measurements can extract about the global charge of the system. So we call this a sharpening transition and it seems to occur again and just to be a generic consequence of charge conservation. So there's really, you know, this is just an example. I'm not going to go into the details here. There's really a lot to uncover. Uh, and there's been many, many, many works in recent years on, on related problems uh, that I'm not really uh, citing extensively here. Okay. All right, so um, let me just wrap up. I think I've been relatively quick, so hopefully I will keep us on schedule. Uh, so I, you know, introduce this class of entanglement transitions, uh, and I, the example of measurement induced criticality is uh, one example. There are related transitions in random tensor networks or in problems of many body localization. Um, so I've sketched this exact mapping onto a classical StatMec model. Uh, I didn't go really into the details, but hopefully you got the, the main idea of using the replica trick and doing those hard averages analytically. Uh, and so this, this gives you some kind of analytic handle on, you know, we are fam 
the replica trick is nasty, but we have more handle on classical stat make models than we do on entanglement in non-equilibrium open quantum systems. Uh, so this gives you at least some analytic handle on a field theory description of such entanglement transitions. So we have really a full analytic handle in that limit of large Hilbert space dimension where it maps onto calculation. Uh, but in general, for say qubits, this is very much an open question. And I, I've shown that we understand a bit you know, numerically, we can extract some effective sensor charge, we can compute some scaling dimension. Uh, but, you know, as far as we know, this is as hard as solving the quantum hole plateau transition. Uh, and, and so maybe Hubert can also solve this uh, log CFT at some point in the near future. Okay. And so there's still a lot of things to do, like classification, asking about universality classes. Uh, I should mention there was also a related experiment that appeared a few months ago. Um, and yeah. And so with this, let me thank you very much for your attention and thank you and happy birthday, Hubert. Thanks. Are there any questions? Uh, Jasper. Hi, well, nice to see you. Um, Hi. So I was wondering, so did anybody try to see what happens if you uh, increase the spin on each uh, link in this model? So instead of taking spin one half, you could take spin one, for example. Um, yeah, so, so in the context of hard gates, like in, in the, the main setup I talked about, we, we don't expect, we expect this would not change anything. So the, the StatMec model doesn't depend on that. Like the symmetry of the StatMec model doesn't depend on the size of the on-site Hilbert space. So we expect there to be some universality. Uh, the numerics is very hard to do, of course. Like if you, you know, you're limited to already 20 sites if you do qubits. So if you do spin one, you know, yeah, you, you're restricting the numerics that you can do really. Uh, if you change the family of gates that you use, so instead of hard gates, you use Clifford gates, you can definitely do that. Um, and actually, we've been doing that in the context of the Clifford group here uh, in, in that paper. So, so here, there's actually some interesting dependence on the size of the Hilbert space. Okay. Well, I pass the microphone to Hubert then. Nice talk. Um, so what is the perturbation? You know, you go back to your diagram, you say percolation yeah. plus, so wha what do you know about mm -hmm. that perturbation in D equals two? Surely it must be known. No? What the yeah, so, so it's, it, it's, it's basically the two hole operator. Ah. Um, so, so, so it's written like the Lagrangian is written below here. So, so you see like it's a bit schematic, but it's, it's a POTS model, but the number of states the states in the POTS model are perturbations. And you're perturbing by this, the W perturbation here is the perturbation. So W is a class function of SQ. So, so this, basically this is breaking, this is implementing the symmetry breaking. You start from SQ factorial and you go to SQ cross SQ. And so you see it's quadrat, I mean, it's basically a two hole operator, but with some specific coefficients. Okay, so, yeah, it's fascinating. Okay. Thank you, Omar. See you soon. Uh, other things? Anyone? Yeah. Thanks. Hi, Roman. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Um, could, could you say a bit more about um, what you said in, in answer to Jesper about the, how the model changes for Clifford? how the effective model changes for Clifford? Oh, yeah. Um, Thank you. Yeah, so this is something we, we're still working on, but we're, we're finishing. So, so we, we've, we've been playing the same game uh, for Clifford gates, uh, so deriving the StatMec model. And so the main difference is this, you know, this formula. And so, like I said, you have to think about the commutant of the Clifford group. So instead of permutations, you have, you know, the, the commutant is a bit bigger, is a lot bigger than, than it's not even a group, right? And it will, it will be a lot bigger than the permutation group. Uh, so, but we, we've been working on deriving this StatMec model. So the interesting thing is that the StatMec model for Clifford has some structure that depends precisely on the dimension of the on-site Hilbert space. So in particular, it depends on the prime decomposition of that number. 
So if you write the on-site open space dimension as p to the n, where p is prime and n is some integer, uh, the universality class depends on the prime p, but it doesn't depend on n. Uh, so, so it has some really interesting structure. And so we've, you know, uh, Yadong Li in particular has been running, uh, has been checking this numerically for a while now, and they have a lot of numerical evidence that this is true. Uh, so, so if you take, you know, d equals two and d equals four, they have the same universality class. But if you take d equals two and d equals three, you find a different universality class. Um, and, you know, and, and as you take the prime to be large, you approach calculation as well. And so you can see this numerically. Interesting. Th thank you. Thanks. Anything else? Okay. I think we're running out of time. So we're going to leave it here and go to the next talk. Thank you very much, Roman, again. Thank you.